Welcome to the Deep Dive, the advanced web development podcast brought to you by InDev.Dev. Hello, everyone. Today, I have a special guest for you on the Deep Dive. Um, he has created a framework, an open source framework for rapid application development. It's a full stack framework and you get a lot of things just handed over for free. So without further ado, let me introduce Mahmoud Abdul Jawad. Welcome Mahmoud. Hello. Thank you, uh, Lars, for uh, inviting me. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for coming. You know, um, I'm really interested to learn the story about the framework and the, yeah, your company that, that started it. But first, let me hear this story about how you got into computers. Okay, so um, this is something that gives me a little giggle every time I, rem I remember this story. I mean, because I, I really find it amazing how, how this happened. So when uh, I was a child, child i mean uh, um computers were getting attention but wasn't that much attention so not every household needed to um really get a computer so uh when uh, my father noticed that uh, computers are becoming more and more important he got us one at home and uh of course i mean what a what a 10 year old kid would do with a computer of course fill it with games and just go on with uh, with uh, continuous gaming day and night. And my father didn't like that because he initially thought he's bringing me a device that I will use to increase my knowledge and learn new things because that's what he saw others are doing with computers. So uh, quickly he told me that games are not allowed and I'm only allowed to use this device, the computer that he got me for learning purposes only. And uh, and I had I had internet at those days and I was like, okay, what can I do? I mean, that is that is too much hard for me to to decide at that time. So it gave me that uh, a child childish lovely idea that okay if i make my own games i will be able to play them and i will be able to convince my father that hey this is not gaming in fact this is learning and i am learning out of this process so this is how i got into computers this is how i got into programming actually but yes it was not a very good uh, beginning because uh, at those days, uh, there is no way a single person can make a game, specifically 3D uh, game, which I was more, most interested in. And uh, yeah, I quickly realized, no, gaming development from the beginning is not a good thing. And I need to try something a little easier to get myself more practice. So I began with making you know, calculators, just like we all started with programming and uh, uh, notepad alternatives and these stuff for desktop programming and then i moved to web development and uh, i've been stuck with web development for the past uh, almost 20 years very nice so your father banned you from the computer or for, because you were gaming but then he allowed you to do programming so you started programming games exactly <laughs> so, so that you would be able to play games anyways yeah i mean this this always gives me a smile that when i remember this story because like wow i mean if if, I mean, I always think between me and myself, like if my father never actually stopped me from gaming on the computer, would I be the programmer I am today? I mean, I'm always in doubt of this actually. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Who knows? But uh, here we are many years yes. later. And uh... I'm glad for his decision. I really, I'm, I'm really glad for what he did. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm trying to teach my daughters to, well, they are all already programming games. They're following tutorials. So it's exciting Thank to see you. what that will bring. Yeah. They're doing it for well, the same reasons they like to <laughs> that's great okay so how did you start as like um self-employed or what did you do before that so when i began learning about uh web development specifically when i become more more and more into development because i i began with learning asp in the beginning uh that's what everybody was saying oh it is the biggest thing ever and then yeah, asp right. Um, sorry? ASP Classic, VB Script? Yes, yeah. A ASP Classic, yes, okay. VB Script, yes, you're right. Okay, and then I moved into ASP.NET at the early stages of it, and I, I felt that it's a huge burden. For, for some reason, I didn't like uh, how this 
uh, how this transition occurred. And then I also became aware of Linux and I came aware of about different operating and alternative operating systems. Yes, I knew they existed before, but I became more aware of their existence. And somehow I had this idea that web development should happen on Linux boxes, which means I need to do to choose something that works on Linux. And then I moved to PHP and uh, I've been uh, and then for following that I've, I've been uh, continuing to improve my skills on uh, PHP just out of curiosity and just out of uh, the, the love of gaining knowledge on that sector because I really liked uh, web development although I've never had uh, the the idea to change to make this into a business at any point but then uh, eventually me and uh, a friend of mine who is also into computers but he is more of a of a creative guy so he is more of a designing and uh, CSS at that time uh, we were distant uh, friends like ooh, we were connected through a series of friends but we knew each other and at some point we sat together and then we started discussing and then we realized we are actually like we can complete each other and then we decided okay let's do something let's just start a something out of a out of a, out of a hobby and see what happens and eventually this became a business that i've been uh, in for the past uh, decade very good so which kind of customers have you been working with which industries which type of project so initially we started with uh, regular web development so um, any website of any kind we would be working on it um uh, i uh like just three years into that we realized that we are actually uh for some reason we have more potential in uh, working with the small and medium businesses in getting their um, regular conventional tasks uh, automated as well as bringing digital transformation to their business and uh, we tested with this idea and we had very very successful projects when we started with it and then we continued with that so so today our main customers are uh, startups uh, that are not related to tech, but just in any kind of uh, uh, other business. And then uh, small and medium businesses, uh, which need uh, the expertise to have their business transformed into a digital ready business. Very nice. So it's interesting to hear about your tech path because you started with ASP Classic, right? Yes. And moved on to focusing more on even more on web development. And then you got into Linux and maintaining Linux machines. Back then it was all physical machines. <laughs> uh, yes, it was. <laughs> actually had servers running <laughs> yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. I, of course, someone still still does today, but it was the norm back then. Yeah. So then you got into PHP, but I know that what you're using now is not PHP anymore. Yes. Tell us about that. So yeah, so uh, PHP is a great uh, programming language. I mean, uh, it introduced me quickly to a lot of ideas about web development that I would really not be able to uh, get the glimpse of quickly with, uh, I believe, any other technology. But uh, the way it's structured is what uh, what pushed me away from it eventually because everything in PHP is there together as a single piece of uh, structure. Uh, somehow, I was, although MVC frameworks were there, although all approaches were there, I still was not convinced that this is the best approach, specifically when I was working with digital transformation projects where, where you need to be very quick in implementing changes because these changes are affecting the business. You cannot tell them, hey, wait, I need to consult the designer who need to work on that specific design of the page and allow me to, to know which elements I need to change and which to keep and then write the code for that and everything. So um, quickly after that, I uh, 
after realizing that PHP uh, is still limited on that topic, and uh, I have to be uh, clear here, I'm not attacking PHP at all. I have to say that I still uh, advise a lot of people who are getting into web development to go with PHP. I advise a lot of my friends who want to start an online website to go with WordPress. I'm not at all attacking PHP or um, trying to say that it is anything less than that. But for my use case, it wasn't the best. So I'm talking about my personal aspect here only. And then, uh, yeah. So uh, I had to go with either Ruby or Python because I had basic ex experience with both. I ended up with Python. Somehow I liked it more and uh, I was convinced a lot because I saw uh, a lot of great projects done with it. So I was a lot convinced that, okay, Python is the answer for that. And uh, I quickly began to build a lot of blocks that I am reusing in my digital transformation projects. And these blocks that the team built, uh, initially they were just like, uh, separate modules that we can reuse in the projects and uh, with assistant of uh, then angular js allowed us to create a completely modern approach to digital transformation projects which allowed us to um, keep the uh, the ability of rapidly improving the uh, the projects we are working on or we worked on, as well as keeping the uh, the structure reusable for the pro uh, future projects. And that's when I realized these blocks can become together and work together as a framework. And oh. that's 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 how that's how it started. So you started a framework for your company for all the projects yeah. uh, where you had to get up and running fast. These were smaller and medium sized companies. Company, so maybe it was smaller budgets, at least uh, in the beginning. Yes, yes. Uh, of course, a huge portion of our approach of reusing the components and uh, the modules that we built was the idea that if we can do it faster, we will be able to lower the cost on these companies. And and uh, frankly speaking, I mean, uh, up until Corona uh, pandemic in uh, early 2020, digital transformation pitching was really, really, really hard. I mean, you come to a business, you know their problem is the need of automating specific tasks, adding specific digital transformation approach, and they will be able to run their business 10x, okay? But they still don't, they, they are still unaware of uh, the potential that digital transformation brings to the business. So uh, being able to pitch a digital transformation project with low cost to these small and medium businesses was a, was a strategy that we had to take in order to be able to convince them to work on such projects. Sure. So when did it actually become a framework that you brought with you for every new project? So uh, in, almost in, uh, in uh, 2014, um, these separate modules that we were uh, connecting through a uh, different uh, web engine at that time. Uh, we, we brought it together in, in the team and we thought, okay, what can we do this? Shall we rebuild the same thing over a current framework that we are having? Like we're having Flask, we're having in Python, we're having Django. We're having a lot of options actually. And we tried actually, we, we, we tested, we did that trial and error. And we didn't like any of these approaches because they all implemented specific current approaches that are there. So we went ahead and we tested with creating our own framework from the ground up. That means in Python, you need to create even the server, which is receiving the calls. So uh, initially our uh, attempt uh, creating it, we created LIMP then, which is L-I-M-P. So because I'm a, because I'm a huge, uh, GNU Linux and other open source projects fan. I took the GNU approach, which is uh, a complex acronym. And I uh, I suggested that we will call it LIMP, which is LIMP is Massar platform, which, uh, which was 
then an idea that, hey, we want to build something that is our go-to for all our projects in digital transformation. And that's uh, that's where name uh, LIMP came from. And we continue using it until very recent time, actually. Um, so but uh, the name was a recursive acronym. LIMP yes. stands for LIMP is Massa platform and Massa exactly. is the name of your company. Oh, sorry. I should have mentioned that earlier. Yes. Massa is the company name that, that uh, I co-founded. Yes. And that you, is that. you named it in the spirit of open source and you also decided yeah. to, you wanted to bring it to open source, right? Of course. Of course. At, at that time, I, uh, I realized, I mean, I've built a lot of my business on the uh, open source community, free and open source community. And I thought uh, paying back to the community is a must. And this is my chance because publishing random modules benefits nobody. Yes, I know how to use these modules because our team made it and we know how to build to use them. But then when we decided to begin with creating it as a framework and, and we succeeded with initial version and we called it even LIMP, that time it was when we thought, okay, this is our chance to pay back the free and open source community. And yes, we took years actually to bring that, uh, that idea into a reality, but I am always uh, thankful that I finally was able to, to uh, publish this project uh, as a completely standalone uh, project, uh, open source project. Yeah, I thought that was pretty funny with the name and you said it was inspired by the GNU, GNU, GNU project, uh, and I, if I remember correctly, that stands for GNU is not Unix. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so it is. It is. Uh, it, it, it might uh, gives you an idea about how much uh, inspired I am by the uh, by uh, by the open source community in general and by GNU Linux operating system specifically. Uh, in 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 my works so yeah that, that's that's how the name came in okay so so it is uh you're using python and what else what other technologies are you using with your framework so we built uh the framework with uh with python as you mentioned and initially we built our own um xml based i wouldn't call it database but it was something like a database system because uh, initially we thought uh, we can optimize things if we do everything together in-house and uh, we built uh, in the uh, data system that we used but quickly uh, learned about mongodb and uh, even from the very first versions of mongodb we got very excited about it it was it was a huge promise and uh, uh, somehow although i don't have this habit of buying into technology quickly I mean, I, I wait until I see uh, some big projects made with it to see how mature uh, a technology can be. But somehow MongoDB was among these very little exceptions that we bought into it very early. And we continue to improve LIMP framework along the path because uh, MongoDB has uh, done amazing job over the years, improving and adding features. And we benefited from adding these features to uh, LIMP framework along the path. Okay, and uh, you started with AngularJS. What are you using today for the client-side version or the client-side of things? Um, I'm still using Angular, of course. Shout out to the Angular uh, team and Angular community in general. It is one of the best things I've ever uh, worked with. I mean, um, I I uh, I cannot find any reason that pulls me out of Angular as long as it is going into the same uh, approach, into the same path that uh, it's been going on for the past uh, years. Uh, on mobile, because we also do uh, mobile apps for our customers uh, when when it is part of the project. Uh, we use uh, native script. It is uh, getting popular recently, but not that much. Native script is, uh, uh, is a set of tools and a framework that builds on top of Angular, although you can use Vue and uh, uh, Vanilla.js with it, but uh, using native script with Angular gives uh, the developers a huge advantage when using it. And also this is a shout out to the native script 
Secret Team, amazing team. They are doing amazing job with the with the technology they are doing. And uh, yes, so that that's what I use for front end. Okay, but just to be clear, you're using Angular today, not Angular JS. No, 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 Angular. Yes, not Angular JS. Of okay. course. I mean, <laughs> I've been giving up actually with the technology. Uh, I mean, uh, Angular JS was huge uh thing when i got into it and when angular 2 what what was uh named angular 2 then came out i was little uh disappointed that uh that i needed to rebuild almost this the whole thing again and again but uh, just few months of waiting i then realized that in fact angular is the future and 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 all the decisions angular team had to had to make to build angular 2 are the correct decisions and i bought into it uh completely very good so let's talk about what is actually in the framework so let i i've used it a bit uh, with your help but uh, i want to hear it from you like wh what is it uh, what are the parts and how do they work together in in your uh, in your mind so um uh the the uh, the framework was uh was developed over the years that means the very first versions of uh, the framework are uh, are not even anything uh, that uh, that is usable uh, in today's terms uh, and and this slow development of the framework allowed me and the team to really rethink all our choices and options now the biggest uh the the biggest win of using this framework is it allows the developers to uh, get a configuration interface like for uh, building their apps so rather than uh, writing full code for everything most of the things and i have to stress on this because uh even in my works even in my projects and although this is my framework and i can go to that extra mile and even add every configuration I might want it for my own projects, I'm still not doing that because my own belief is that uh, being able to config to configure out of uh, the hundred percent what is needed for for your application, going to the level of of reaching seventy or eighty percent just in configuration right, without writing single line of code that is a huge win for the developer and that is our approach with uh, with writing uh, uh, lim which is today uh we are calling it nawa and nawa is uh, an arabic word that is uh, that means core and uh, a shout out to the uh, to the python slack community which uh, helped me choose this name and uh, yes so today nawa framework is is based on this idea it's it's open source which means you can host it on your server you can host it on any cloud it is it it takes very uh, modern approaches and uh, it allows you to get most of the required work out of configuration only yeah and the uh, nawa is spelled uh, n a w a h to people that, that are is not familiar with <laughs> arabic <Yeah. laughs> so uh, and and it means it's the arab word for core right that Yes, that is okay. correct. And the, this is the experience I got firsthand as well, what you're expressing here, that it's very much about being expressive uh, through configuration, but it's configuring Python classes. Uh, so the way I imagine it or would explain it to someone as I'm trying to do now is if you're familiar with a server-side MVC framework like Laravel and PHP or different other ones there and Django and Python, Rails and Ruby, uh, ASP.NET MVC, C for C sharp. If you're familiar with them, you know about models, you know about views and controllers. In our case here, well, first of all, it's for the web API, it's for the backend, it's for the server side. You get a database as well that's based on Mongo, uh, as you said, but you don't have to write all the controllers and views and results and all of that yourself. You basically just have to give the properties, the attributes of the classes, and then Nawa builds the API for you. So you're, you're putting only the classes in you're adding a few annotations to express the data types and and we will discuss the data types uh, some more because they're really interesting but what nawa gives you then is uh, if i remember correctly there's a web socket and there's also an http a web api out of the box just based on those models then you can that, that, yeah that is 
percent correct. Yes. And that is extremely satisfying. I mean, I know zero. <laughs> I have zero knowledge on Python, but just building a class, of course, I can understand what a class looks like, even with Python syntax. Building that and seeing the API up and running, and then you you combine that with an SDK for Angular or native script. You you write a, s a service in Angular, a service class, and you use the the one provided by Nawa to log in, and you're good to go. Then you have the whole web API up and running for you. You can start setting up authorizations and permissions, also based on annotations in your model classes or or whatever you're you're calling them, the, the configurable classes. Yes, you're right. So um, one one of the uh, one of the biggest um, one of the biggest uh, uh, hard times I had when uh, when I was working at early stages in the uh, digital transformation project was the was the idea that having access control is actually most of the work that I need to implement. So I need to write a lot of uh, conditions. I need to make sure that I'm not missing anything. And one of the biggest uh, one of the biggest uh, work a developer does with Nawa is just setting these, I'm calling them in Nawa permission sets. So you just add permission sets to the methods and you have the and you have the crude methods, create, read, update, and delete methods ready for you without need to, to write any code for them. You just configure the level of access for every method of this. And then it allows you even to modify the input and output of each of this method without writing code based on the level of access. So, um, so uh, when 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 I when the developer moves to the front end and we call the the whole thing the endpoints that Nawa uh, creates for you when you launch a Nawa app, as well as the front end combined, we are calling them app. Now the the idea of Calling them a, a single thing is that we believe that although we want to separate them, we want we are using Angular and native script for the front end, and we are using Python code for the back end, which is Nawa. We believe that we believe they should work together. And the SDK is essential part of how Nawa is developed and is working. And when you move to the front end and you become and you and you become uh, aware of the endpoints that you need to connect to, all what you need to do is just connect and based on your authentication and based on the privilege you have as, as a user, you will get uh, relative uh, results from the API, from the endpoint, without the need to worry about writing restrictive code in the front end, which might be a security issue, which might uh, result in unwanted results for the user, gives bad experience for the user. All of that together is solved by having the uh, configuration uh, focusing on uh, access control in NOAA. Yeah, that is extremely helpful and powerful. So it's a really good match for CRUD style applications, as you're saying, when you have to manipulate a lot of data, but it's also just a very quick way of, of structuring whatever the business of the the customer has for yeah, data structures, the need to have a relation between whatever data they are working with in their company, and then you can start setting up processes. Do you have something like, what would you do for a background job that would be running continuously and doing automated things without the user uh, intervention? Uh, we, we are having something called the jobs workflow in NOAA, which allows the developer to define a specific method, um, a code that uh, to be run. Now, this specific uh, this specific code or method does not really need to be custom code. It can be custom code, which is most probably uh, going to be the case. But the developer can even just simply specify a specific endpoint method. Any of these crude um, ready methods that are created on behalf of the developer by the NOAA framework, and it will be run into a specific interval. And uh, I've used the cron-like uh, structure. In fact, it's not cron-like, it is cron. So so you yeah. get that one. Uh, um, Linux again. <laughs> Again, Linux, yes. Again, everywhere Linux. <laughs> so you you just specify how you want your job to run in the background just by writing uh, an interval based on cron 
uh, syntax. What did you call those jobs? So we are calling them jobs uh, workflow, and uh, they can be easily defined in uh, in the in the application uh, config in the application main file, which is nawaapp.py, where uh, the developer can define any number of jobs they want to uh, to run uh, in the background. Yeah. So what else do you need for application development? I mean, you've already mentioned a lot of the things that takes a lot of time when you're initially starting out with the projects. You're working on security and authorization and modeling your data and getting a data store, or database, whatever up and running. And Nawa takes care of all of that for you in literally a few hours that you're up and running. Uh, so yeah. the next thing is something like logging and metrics or analytics. And I, I seem to recall you have something for that as well. That is correct. Um, so uh, as part of uh, as part of the uh, the whole application configuration, uh, the the developer can get to uh, specify specific analytics um, uh, records, and these analytics records can be anything. The 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 developer can can just simply go into any of the modules that they are writing, uh, and a module in uh, Nawa is a data type. So uh, the blog is a data type, the comment is a data type, the user. Uh, document itself is a data type in uh, in Nawa, and uh, all of these can be written or improved because uh, Nawa by default gives a huge number of default uh, modules that allow the developer to go get up and starting just without needing to worry about all the basic elements of uh, an application. And uh, and analytics is part of it. So uh, they use the the developer can just simply go into any of these modules and then decide and can just simply write a condition and if this condition is matching then an analytics record will be created and then these analytics are saved in the database for the developer to make use of when they want uh, another thing about uh, about uh, nawa modules is being able to cache the responses so if you are having for example um a blog module which uh, which gives the end users the ability to create blogs as well as reading them uh, using the create and read methods and uh, of course you're not going to have a blog every five seconds so these responses it's better to have them cached into the uh, memory and uh, now allows the developers to just again specify a cache uh, like a cache set and this cache set is basically a condition and, and if the condition is matched uh, now will cache this response and when a user calls for it it will return the cached response and not the actual data now here is one thing that is amazing about the cache responses in Nawa. Nawa will automatically invalidate all these cache responses the minute any of the records related to this module is updated. So if a new record, a new document is created or updated or one is deleted, then all the cache records will be invalidated to make sure that no user is getting outdated data. That sounds like solving one of the hardest computer science problems. <laughs> now, I'm not saying it is going to, of course, resolve the uh, the cache invalidation issue, which we keep uh, going into, but it is, of course, giving the developers a hand in solving the issue. Right. So these um, data types, they have, uh, I don't know what you call them in, in, in Python, but properties of of the, the, the data type and then each property has an attribute annotation on them or maybe they're, they're just called attributes so tell us about what they're actually called and the different attribute types you have in in nawa sure so um in uh, uh one one of the other aspects that we we uh uh, we enjoyed having when we developed LEM in the in the early days is is uh, taking off ourselves the burden of type checking the, the the user input. So instead of having again writing conditions to check the data type, we embedded data types 
of every single attribute of a module. So an attribute of a module, like for example, let's go back to the blog example. Uh, in a blog module, you probably have a title, you have a content, you have, uh, you have for example, category, you have these uh values these attributes we are calling them attributes in uh, in noah and you specify what is the data type of each of these attributes so these attributes can have huge various data types um it, it can be string it can be integer it can be float uh, as in uh, dot uh, dot float number uh, it can be email it can be phone number it can be a uri it can be an ip it can be um it can be something that i'm calling local string which means the ability to embed two uh two values based on the languages or localizations the app is supporting. Uh, since I am from the UAE, where we are having a huge uh, amount of uh, uh, diversity of uh, backgrounds, uh, uh, working with Arabic and English is a must in UAE, in a business. It is, you cannot have a business in UAE without uh, working with these two languages. So, uh, in fact, I've even had business uh, projects that I had to implement even three or four languages, uh, but the, the 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 basic is Arabic and English. So uh, uh, when uh, whenever I had something ready made that we used before building Lamb in the in the early days, it was always single language thing. It was a single language solution that you need to implement uh, a second language on top of it in a hacky method. It's not built in. And of course, we took notice of this issue that we are we are facing and we moved that into uh, LEMP and later on into NOAA. And that means now we can simply create a single data type and we embed the values for the uh, for the different localizations and we will show the values required based on the uh, user preference uh, just as that so the data types are actually very very uh variant and uh, uh, they allow almost all use cases that we came across and on top of that we have created the ability to extend the data type so if a developer comes in and finds that the data type uh, she or he uh, are looking for is not there uh, they can simply create uh, a python method that checks the input value and according to specific uh, criteria they want they will either uh, return the value after confirming that it is fine or throw an error uh, raise an exception in python which uh, tells noah uh, api that hey this is not acceptable value and then accordingly uh, the end user at the front end will receive that error message and will realize or understand that this value was not accepted so now you're telling me that you also solved globalization that's also something <laughs> you provide out of the box so uh, again um noah is trying to solve a lot of the issues we face and although i believe it has uh done us amazing job in solving most of our issues that we are facing i still believe that somebody can come in and even improve on the solutions that we implemented um i'm pretty sure the uh linux when he created linux kernel in the early 90s it was perfect but today we are at 5.9 and uh, and we are still seeing improvements to it and it is the biggest open source project what i'm trying to say here is uh whatever uh creativity a group of people can come up with there is somebody out of that group can come in and even improve the work of that group and add to them so yes i am trying to solve a lot of issues with uh, noah but i'm still pretty sure we can still uh, add to that and we still can improve that so the, the locale strings they they have a value per per language or locale um so i can't remember how is it like when you're querying for for that data do you always get all of the values or can you ask for just one or, or two of them two of the languages so th this was uh, this was debated when we initially started working with uh, with a local type in uh, in uh, lim uh 
initially we decided that we will return the values only based on the uh, query so you can in your query specify that hey only return a specific local values to me but for for specific reasons we decided that we will return all the values according to uh, what is specified. And then it will be just the task of the front end to pick the localization based on the user preference and show that value. Okay, do you have anything in the Angular SDK to help with translating that to the, the template? Um, so in, uh, in Angular SDK, I have to say I got uh, I got uh, huge uh, changes at some point when we were working with Angular when I had to work on a project that was partially done on Firebase and when I got to work with Firebase I realized that uh, hey we have a lot in common but uh, one huge point I was glad that uh, that I worked with uh, on our framework is actually the ability to take our API anywhere, unlike Firebase, which is uh, proprietary and only on the on Google servers. So uh, still, I was able to get an amazing point of view of how uh, Firebase is doing authentication. And I got uh, wowed by the way it was done. And, and eventually, I was able to replicate the same behavior of how uh, of how uh, Firebase is doing authentication and allowed me to create an easier authentication system on the front end for NOAA apps. Uh, on, on, on querying uh, the endpoints on NOAA, it is just simply specifying an endpoint and waiting for the results through uh, RxJS. Uh, observables and uh, and then if the developer wants to specify specific attributes to return if he doesn't want the full length documents if he wants for if he is specifying for example list of blogs and he just wants the titles he can specify that he just wants the titles and he will just get the titles back which which is one of the um optimization solutions that we have put into uh nawa uh in fact even choosing websocket was an optimization solution because at some point uh we did our tests and we re we realized that using websocket is actually minimizing the time for the calls although it adds a little of uh bottleneck at some in in some cases uh but uh, overall it is improving the uh responsibility uh re responsible res okay i'm <laughs> <laughs> I it is a uh, yeah responsiveness it is already getting late here so uh, uh, the, w which allows the app to uh, to give the user better experience uh, with lower resources uh, and the SDK was focused on getting the job done at the easiest way so you just make calls 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 that's it there's nothing special there's nothing nothing special that you need to add to the sdk in order to make it work or or link it to the uh to the endpoints. Right, so you can even pick out certain properties of the data structures you're returning. So it's a little similar to GraphQL in that in that way. Uh, you are also able to filter your data. Is that correct? Of course, that's a must. I mean, you you cannot have um, you cannot have uh, like one call to to fit all. Of course, you want to have uh, a query system. So we we developed a, a query system which is based on combination of arrays and uh, JSON objects if you or JavaScript objects in your uh, call methods and uh, it, it allows the developer to specify specific combination like and and or and uh, based on this combination the developer can decide what results they want to receive from that call. Okay that sounds a little bit like uh, OO, what's it called old data or OO data probably old data that was popular uh, some some years ago. Um, where I'm not familiar with that. Okay, well, that yes. is kind of interesting. You're inventing this, the same thing, um, uh, but of course, that's because it's useful. So, how are you doing? Can you do like full text search uh, in your data? Yes, I mean, uh, one of the good aspects of Mongo is uh, being able to create a text search index. 
And because of that, we are able to implement full text search just by simply uh, specifying that you uh, you want to enable search index on that module, and you will be able to make a query on that, and you will get results. Okay. Yeah. So another checkbox on the list: full text search. <laughs> And uh, what else have we got left? Well, there are other parts to Nawa as well. There, I remember there's kind of a toolbox, or that's what I call it, where, where you sandbox. can go and inspect your data and communicate with your Nawa backend. What do you call it? Yeah, we call that sandbox for some reason. Uh, for some reason, also, it's not sandbox. Uh, it's uh, more of a web-ready uh, interface that allows you to connect to any of your uh, Nawa endpoints and uh, make the calls, uh, whether whether it is read, create, update, delete calls, uh, authenticate as admin or as a regular user, check the data, read everything. Uh, this initially was created in order to allow us to, um, to check the responses and be able to help the uh, customers we are working with understand uh, what values they are expecting to receive without the need to use the same interface that we developed for them, which is like a com complete dashboard, complicated tools or stuff like that. So, so we are having more of console-like interface, but it is web-based. And NOAA Sandbox is, uh, is uh, available as part of uh, uh, NAWA uh, on GitHub, and it can be even used directly online without the need to uh, clone it or build it again. It's it's just available online for any quick use. Uh, to connect to Nawa instances and work with them. That's very cool. And when I saw that, I remember telling you that it reminded me of the graphical um, UI for, for GraphQL. <laughs> so yeah, and I'm really glad that you yes. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it gave me an idea about how to improve the design. Of course, we programmers are terrible when, when it comes to design. We, we just want things that work. So, so the initial version of LEMP Sandbox was really not that appealing at all. And uh, thanks to you, uh, when you uh, introduced me to, I think it's called Graph, uh, uh, Graphically, I think, something like GraphQLI. Yeah, I, Graph I, I call I it Graphical. I don't know if that's the right pronunciation, but uh, it's GraphIQL. Ah, yes. So, so you can also uh, think of it as the interactive thing for GraphQL, I guess. That is correct. And I spent uh, some days looking at it. And I was like, wow, that is really beautiful. How come I did not think of something like this? And then when uh, I worked on uh, Nawa Sandbox, which is the little improved version of LEM uh, Sandbox, uh, I tried to take parts of that uh, design aspect, uh, which really made even the experience for me, even using it, is a lot better. Nice. Yeah. Other parts that I remember is there's a CLI for Nawa. So what can yes. that do? So uh, Nawa CLI is two things actually. I'm, although I'm calling it Nawa CLI, but it's actually two, not one. When when you want to begin working with Nawa to create a new project, you install a Python package, which is called Nawa CLI, and you use that to create a new project. Nawa CLI will allow you to create the project. It will, it will clone some uh, resources available online, and uh, this assures that you are always getting the updated version of the framework as well as the project structure, even if you are running uh, different uh, CLI version. And, uh, and then when you try to run Nawa CLI from within the project context, it will detect that and it will run a built-in version of the CLI, which works with the project context itself, such as launching the project, which is like starting the endpoints, as well as uh, running the test workflows, which is like running the tests that you are writing for your Nawa apps and uh, generating reference file, which is creating a full reference of all the endpoints, all the methods, all the access control permission sets, which, for example, if you are trying to tell the other developers with you, hey, I created this module and this module is having so-and-so attributes, so-and-so permission sets, all you just need to do, and instead of just telling them that, just generate, go into your project, Nawa generate reference, and it will create that nice markdown file for you 
you can share it with them and it will tell them everything they need without even needing to ask you or even going into the source code you've got to stop soon because this just keeps <laughs> keeps on going it's the framework <laughs> that keeps on giving everything yeah. you need so i i hear i heard you saying that the cli is used for managing dependencies it's used for running tests for your nawa application and you can generate a reference markdown documentation based on your modules that is correct yes you're right okay can it uh, generate anything for you like modules or anything like that? No, we, uh, although at some point we added this ability in, in an earlier version of LEM, and that was, a, that was a version that we've never published because when we've been working with LEM, we've had like an open source version and, uh, and a non-open source version because not everything we were allowed or we would have some complications about even sharing them. So we tried that internally, but realized that uh, starting a module, starting an AWA or LIMP module then was just a matter of uh, a very easy boilerplate that can be copied and pasted. So we refrained from, added, from adding this uh, uh, at, at a later stage and we actually removed it completely from, from LIMP. So uh, yes, I know most of the modern frameworks they have like the generate uh, option where you can just simply go ahead and generate components, modules, whatever. Um, uh, I have to say uh, my decisions or my options, uh, me as a person or even in the team, are not always the best. I mean, w my options and decisions specifically in programming, they keep changing all the time. So yes, I might think this idea is not a good idea today. Tomorrow somebody might come in and just convince me, hey, I mean, why not? I mean, yes. So although it is missing this functionality today, I would be uh, really uh, willing to add it on a later version if somebody uh, really hardly wants it. Okay, good to know. And as part of rebranding it, you also moved it to its own GitHub organization called Nawa.io. That is correct. That is Again, correct. to make it clear that this is open source and even though you're backing it with your company, it's for the community and contributions are welcome right that is correct in fact my target is to make it event community driven yes i i i will be continuing to support it on on a on a personal level and on a business level from my company because i will keep using it but but my target is to have it reach a point where it is community driven because uh i believe that uh business driven projects will always be uh strong, uh, it, it will have its own strong ideas that will fit very unique use cases. So by having it more community driven, uh, my target is to benefit the community from this project, which is the whole point of opening source the project. I mean, if I am making it open source, but then I am refraining from adding features or making modifications that benefit the majority of the open source project, then I'm not benefiting them actually. So part of benefiting them is to hopefully one day make it uh, completely community driven. It's a, a very nice vision. Um, there's also recently you you added, and it's been there for a while, but you've been improving it a lot, the Nawa documentation. And specifically, there's a tutorial where you go from zero to hero in just a few hours. So if anyone listening wants to try out Nawa, go for the nawa-io github organization look for nawa docs and that'll tell you everything you need to get going you'll be building a, a blog application with the back end and the front end in probably in angular right that is correct in angular yes so although i have to i have to stress on this at some point we actually um even created different sdks uh i've had uh, some uh, other uh, people interested in now in LEMP then and helped me writing SDKs for other uh, for for other platforms like for example for Java for Android as well as for Objective C for sorry for Swift for iOS and uh, then I had a version which is uh, working with React but because of the changes 
uh, that were introduced to LEMB at, at later stage, those changes broke the SDKs, which means, uh, yes, it can be ported again and improved and make it uh, more compatible with uh, a NOAA version, but uh, uh, at, at the current time, it's only native script and Angular that are supported, uh, but I'm still looking forward to bring back uh, the support for React and native Java Android, as well as uh, Swift for iOS. Uh, into a NOAA ecosystem. Okay, so again, you're welcoming uh, great additions to the framework, contribution for anyone that, that sees the, the value of this and, and wants to add something that makes it fit into the kind of business and, and projects they're doing and the tech that they're using. Because of course, in the end, it's a web API with a pr protocol and structure for the responses you're returning. And so of course you can add any client side uh, language and, and framework on top of that. That is correct, that is correct. I would, um... I would uh, stress on this point. I mean, contributions are really, really welcome uh, and they can be anything. They can be uh, improving the documents. They can be suggesting uh, modifications or features or even working with the internals uh, or working on developing the SDKs. Uh, I am really uh, uh, hoping uh, somebody might uh, uh, get uh, hyped about this. And uh, uh, if uh, anyone is having a time to put into developing or improving the earlier version SDKs, I would completely welcome that. And I would, I would be working with them closely in order to get that uh, up and running. So maybe even someone who wanted to write an article about their first experience with Noir or do a live stream, trying it out, that could be interesting as well. Of course, of course. I mean, I cannot really uh, list all the uh, kind of community wise contributions to any open source project because they are really various. I mean, that is one of the uh, unique uh, things about uh, open source community is that it has a lot of methods of contributing to any open source project. So as you mentioned, even recording a YouTube video or, or having a live stream or writing an article or having a podcast episode like what you are doing here. And I'm, I'm again thankful for your time here, Lars, on, in bringing uh, the uh, the attention to Noah and the uh, project uh, to the to your audience. So a lot of ways to contribute, and I would totally welcome all of them. That's very nice, and you are very welcome for. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to have you here as well because I, I think it's an exciting project. I've been following it for a few years, and uh, I, I'm happy to to learn that your vision for the project was exactly that first-hand experience I got that you can get 80% of the way with just simple configurations. That is extremely powerful. I mean, I, I have, I, I mean, I really have zero Python experience. So to get started, I installed Python, I installed Mongo, and that was it. I didn't even have to know anything about Mongo, but after doing the initial application and, and we set up some demos, we even, there's also an image data type or attribute, I remember. So we created some profile pages and, and stuff like that and did an Angular app in, in, in no time, like a, a few hours. And afterwards I went into the Mongo database using the Compass tool, the UI tool, and I could see all yeah. the data structures that I have created my data type for. So that was really, really a nice experience. And uh, and you're not branding it as get up and running in five minutes, but that is almost what this product is or this framework is all about. So uh, I'm really glad that you uh, you had this uh, this positive experience with it. And uh, and uh, in fact, I I. I tried myself to refrain from uh, getting a lot of buzzwords uh, when I tried to uh, introduce anybody to Nawa or even Lemp back in the days because I am worried that I would be making bigger promise than what the framework is doing. So if I make less promise than what the framework is doing, that's fine. I mean, the, the developer would be uh, more excited because he is seeing that the framework is doing better than what he expected. But if I make bigger promise, then it will be a problem, and I don't. I really don't want to to look like somebody who is trying to push somebody hard when it's actually not doing that. Right. You are very humble, but uh, that has left me even more impressed with all of this work and. Thank you. 
what came out of it and that you're sharing all of this with the community. You're using the, the GNU licenses as well for the project. So it's really in the spirit of, of open source and, and sharing it with the world. Yes. Yes. Hopefully I'm, I'm really hoping that, that, uh, uh, Yes, I mean, uh, since it is open source, it can be used for any project, but I'm really hoping that um, it, it really reach the point where it is something that I can feel as a payback to the community. That is that is the whole point of uh, open sourcing it, and I'm really hoping to get into that point at, at uh, yeah, sooner or later, but at some stage. Okay. I'm looking through my list here and we, we discovered a lot of parts uh, that are comes with Nawa out of the box and it's just an amazing feature set. I mean, it's, it's almost every tool you need to get up and running. Um, I'll say that again. Is there anything uh, you feel that we didn't mention that you wanted to, to touch on uh, about the Nawa framework? So uh, I have to say that uh, we uh, covered everything about Nawa. Okay, but what I what I want to say is um, one of the one of the uh, one of the things about Nawa itself is is the idea that it comes as a one package. It gives you everything together. I, I mentioned this earlier, but I need to stress on this again because um, you I, I did not really get that in uh, with, with different projects before, and this allows you to really uh, rest your mind and release your mind from having to think a lot of decisions. So these decisions are all made on, on your behalf, but according to your needs and your requirements. So that is one of the uh, biggest points about NOAA that I really uh, like and I really uh, think that other developers who might uh, who, who might be confused whether to go with O or uh, with A or B will just find that NOAA made the decision on their behalf on C and that means they really don't need to spend more time on that decision making that is a, a very very good philosophy and it really shows in in the outcome of, of all your work uh, what's your biggest success story with nawa with using it in your business so uh um for nawa i mean uh we've used it with many projects many companies but uh one was one which was quite uh, an amazing experience that i wasn't really uh, sure how it's how it was so, uh, running it to serve a real estate company campaign that estimated initially 20,000 users uh, per day. And th that's not really a big number, but then the problem is when uh, the, the per day aspect is not really per day, it's actually coming over three or four hours because that was the target of the campaign. And I needed to make sure that uh, NOAA will not generate or it will not have a bottleneck issue that might make the services fail. And uh, uh, I have to say, uh, thanks God, I did not fall into this issue. And uh, we even got up to 30, we got even like we we even passed that 20,000 expected number of users and we got to 30,000 and it still worked. Now, uh, it is taking modern approach. So of course we took more of like, we uh, like we, we already prepared everything. So we had few instances running and everything, but we did not like really like make it like 10 instances to make it not fall down. We, we just had two instances, okay? Uh, and I was ready to add the instances if things go wrong, but thankfully things didn't go wrong. And I was really, really, that was like a proud moment, you know, like one of these like, wow, I mean, I've really did, I've really made the thing me and the team, of course, I mean, we've really made something that is usable, that is not really um, just writing uh, on the paper, but not uh, not usable when it's needed the most. Yeah, that, you know, this is actually a, a pretty good approach for developing a framework or a platform. I, I've been involved in that a few times myself, and you really need the use cases to drive it, to drive the decisions and drive the design. Without that, you're, you lose touch with what it's actually used for. And now you, you saw that yourself and even at this high scale 
usability context that even then it could do great things and that must must have uh, caused you to stop up and think like what have i done <laughs> i've done something yeah. amazing actually and you you have been truly blessed by allah in my opinion thank you for that and yes uh uh it, it is it is uh uh the blessings are there of course and the hard work uh pays of course i i do believe that uh, uh we as a team we 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 made something but again uh, one of the one of the biggest aspects is lem then or nawa today is really developed over years Uh, we really weren't at all in a hurry to develop it and this is one of the this is probably one of the reasons we are having what we are having today with nawa because uh, we really did not need to hurry up and make random decisions of course at the beginning we made random decisions and then along the path we we improved these decisions we which even went with trial and error a lot of times and we ended up with what we have today yeah, so you you it was battle proven before you gave it as an open source project available to the, the public yes it is yes it is although i have to say that it is battle proven to to my use cases of course i mean uh when others might use it they will have they they will find some issues and that's totally fine i mean at the end of the day nothing is perfect although we 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 have a goal of perfection all of us all the humans all the time for all the works but but nothing is perfect and eventually things might be uh not perfect for everybody i mean things might not be all right for everybody and that's fine because uh, we can hear from those who are having some suggestions some expectations that failed with nawa and then we can see what we can improve nawa on that basis very good mahmoud uh, is there something you want to share with all of us um, before we end I really uh, uh I really came here to talk about Nawa so thank you so much for giving that me the time to speak about it and I'm really uh, hoping that uh, somebody give it a time to uh work with it as a side project side uh, um even for a simple uh business project I'm really hoping that they will find it beneficial uh, beyond that uh, nothing to add and thank you so much for hosting me today i'm really glad that i had the time to speak to you as well as speak about noah thank you for coming mahmoud it's been my absolute pleasure and i wish you all the best with noah in the future as well thank you wish you the best as well with all of your works the deep dive was brought to you by indepth.dev